I'd like to introduce um, Morgan Rogers from Università degli Studi del Insupria. Perfect pronunciation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers of this conference. It's the first conference that I've done in a while and I'm really excited about it. So um, here is my sketch of topological semigalois theory. Uh, so I appreciate that this being a, um, a conference on category theory rather than algebra. Uh, perhaps Galois theory isn't the most familiar to everyone. So I'm going to go through uh, classical Galois theory quickly um, to give some background uh, before I get into the category and topos theory. So classical Galois theory is, well, describes a relationship between groups and field extensions. Now, you may also not be that familiar with field extensions, so let me give you an example. So we fix a base field. Hopefully, you're all familiar with the field of the rational numbers. And we extend that field by adding the roots of some polynomials. Uh, and then we close under the field operations. Thanks. Um, so in, in this instance, I'm going to take the square root of 2 and the square root of 3, which are the solutions of the polynomials x squared minus 2 equals 0, and x squared minus 3 equals 0. So this gives us a field extension, just one field containing a number. And we can ask about fields which live in between these two, uh, so intermediate subfields. So how many are there? If you are seeing this problem for the first time, you might think that there could be rather a large number, because there are lots of numbers in, in this larger field which aren't in the rationals, and so maybe we could just add any of those and we'd get some field, which makes it sound like there could be infinitely many. Um, if we kind of structure that thought a little bit, we observe that we can express any element of this larger field in a fixed form. And actually any intermediate subfield um, has to be a subvector space. So that constrains things a bit, although it seems like there could still be infinitely many. But actually, the fact that it has to be closed under the field operations uh, makes the structure of the intermediate subfields very rigid. Um, so in fact, there are only three other than Q and Q extended root 2 and root 3, which are uh, Q extended root 2, Q extended root 3, and Q extended root 6. Um, so how might we have on this. I'm going to take a segue, which if you're not familiar with Galois theory will seem a bit mysterious, um, but that's kind of why it's significant. So now let's consider the automorphisms of Q of root 2 root 3, um, which fix the rationals inside this field. So we're looking at ring holomorphisms, so they have to preserve all of the operations of the field. Um, but they have to fix the rationals inside. So it's like very, very rigid automorphisms. Um, and these form a group, because obviously I can compose them and invert them by definition, uh, which is called the Galois group of this extension. Uh, so in a precise sense, these correspond to permutations of the roots of the polynomials define, defining the added elements. So um, I don't have a way to write on this screen, so I'll just have to say it verbally. Um, but take, for example, the square root of 2. It's kind of defined by the fact that x squared minus 2 equals 0. But we know that because the, any automorphism has to fix 2, we know that root 2 has to get mapped by an automorphism to something whose square is, is still 2, which means that there are only two places that the square root of 2 can go, which is to plus or minus the square root of 2, and similarly for the square root of 3. Um, and so while these automorphisms are required to fix the rationals, we can ask which other elements are fixed. And it turns out that this always gives a subfield. In fact, special case of the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, which I'll present in full generality in a moment, we have an order of preserving, uh, sorry, an order of reversing correspondence between the intermediate subfields uh, in this field extension and subgroups of this Galois group, which looks like this. So here, what is the identity element of the group? Um, F is the element that switches uh, root two 
and it's and minus root two and g is the one that switches uh, root three and minus root three. Um, I'm supposed to credit this to whoever made it on Wikipedia, but it's it said made by self with a capital S, so maybe someone whose last name is self. Who knows? Um, so some here's the more general uh, form. Uh, suppose we have a general Galois extension. So in particular, a Galois extension is required to be algebraic, which means that every element of L is the root of some polynomial uh, with coefficients in K. I'll explain what these conditions mean in, in a minute. Uh, but then we get this same order reversing correspondence between intermediate subfields and subgroups. So um, normal uh, is a condition about all of the roots of any given polynomial living in the field. So uh, for example, a, an extension which is not normal is a, an extension of the rationals by the cube root of two, which satisfies the polynomial um, x cubed minus two equals zero. Um, the reason being that um, th that has other roots, other complex roots say, uh, which don't lie in that field because that field is a subfield of the real numbers. And so the, Gal the, the Galois group, this group of automorphisms, can't can't move that cube root of two anywhere else. And so any automorphism actually has to fix uh, the whole field. And so we can't get this correspondence. Um, separability similarly is about the roots of polynomials being distinct, because if they're not distinct, then we can't move the roots around. And so the automorphism group can't see, uh, can't distinguish between elements. So, um, as I've kind of just described, these conditions are necessarily insufficient for the group to see all of the extensions, but it can't really see the fields involved. So for example, I could replace the rationals uh, in the example I gave previously with the field with 25 elements and the picture would be the same. The point being, as long as my field has enough structure that the polynomials I am adding the roots of behave in the same way, so, um, for example, I'm not working over characteristic two, so two is equal to zero in that example. That's why I chose this field with characteristic five. Um, I could replace it with almost any field, all but finitely many fields. Well, that's not quite true. All but <laughs> a small class of fields, um, and the picture would still be the same. So really, this is a categorical picture. So you, you may have seen at some point Eugenia Cheng's example of um, prime divisors and the fact that the lattice of divisors of a number um, only depends on the powers of primes that make up that number uh, rather than which specific primes uh, appear. So this is a similar idea. And the automorphism group is really acting on a discrete set. That's something that I'm going to expand on shortly. Uh, but also in the picture I put, on, put up earlier, uh, that's this picture, um, we actually have some extra groupy stuff happening. So I could um, equip these, uh, the, the members of this lattice with their actions by the group, uh, by the automorphism group, by the Galois group. Um, and if I think of these as actions of this Galois group, then actually I can also equip them with the G set homomorphisms. So these have transformations which respect all of the um, all of the things that are happening. It, it, in this case, the Galois group is commutative, so that's kind of automatic. But more generally, I can think of the um, G set homomorphisms of um, of these objects, and I get a richer category uh, with the black lines and the red morphisms. Um, so I'm just going to let you digest that picture for a, for a moment before we go into toposes. So this is where we get categorical. Hopefully you're more comfortable with categories so I can pick up the pace a bit. Uh, so I'm going to define grid and deep toposes as left exact reflections of pre-sheaf categories. Oh, serious. So um, if you're not familiar with pre-sheaf categories, there are special cases of functor categories uh, where we're taking functors into sets. And when I talk about pre-sheaves on a category C, 
then I am actually talking about contravariant functors or functors from C up. So uh, we have, for E to be a greater than topos, it needs to admit an adjunction like this where the left adjoint uh, preserves finite limits and the right adjoint is full on faith. Um, so actually given a category C to define this pre-sheaf category, uh, we can encode the data of, of this such a reflection as a growth indeed topology J on C. I'm not gonna explain what precisely that consists of, but it's some extra data on C. And so I can think of E as being presented uh, via this site as sheaves on the category equipped with the data of the growth indeed topology. Um, hopefully that's reasonably clear. If not, I can give more detail later on. So, uh, Given such a, top, such a category, there are several ways to produce related ones. Um, so suppose that F is a great deep top boss here. Um, I can take a slice category. Uh, here's a forgetful functor. I can take a further reflection, left exact reflection of it. Um, so a left exact reflection of a left exact reflection uh, of a pre sheaf category is in particular a left exact reflection of a pre sheaf category, so that all works. Uh, but on the other side, uh, I can take um, a, uh, an adjunction of this form where the left adjoint is full and faithful, still left exact, but also closed under sub objects. Now, if you're familiar with toposes, this might sound stronger than conditions that you're familiar with, but I can go over that at the end uh, if need be. Now, um, there may be a few further stars because this. The timing is a bit tight on this talk. So anytime you see a star, ask me about it at the end. So under these conditions, all of these three on the outside are great unique topos. So given, here's, here's a nice example, and the examples that we'll be focusing on. Uh, so given a discrete group, we can construct this category of right actions. Uh, actions look like this. Hopefully you're familiar with those if you've done some algebra at some point. Um, but we can alternatively think of a group as a one object category. Uh, and then an action as a functor, and these assemble into a functor category, which is an example of a pre sheaf topos. If this is your first time seeing this fact, um, then go away and work out why it's true. Why, for example, natural transformations between these correspond to um, G set homomorphisms. Uh, so, moving right along. If my group G is equipped with a topology tau, then I can consider the actions which are continuous with respect to the product of the discrete topology on the set and the topology tau on the group. So I'm, I'm looking at this operation here, at putting the discrete topology on A and tau on my group and asking whether this action is continuous. Uh, so as such, I get a, an inclusion of the continuous actions as a full subcategory of uh, the generic actions. Um, and actually, this is left exact uh, thanks to the topology. Uh, thanks, thanks to topologies being closed under intersections, and so products of continuous things uh, and subsets of continuous things uh, continuing to be continuous. <laughs> that was a fun sentence to say. But it also has a right adjoint. Um, so that's what I've just said. Uh, the adjoint sends uh, a G set X to the collection of elements in X, uh, which who, whose collection of elements in G, which fix it, is open in the topology tau. So I'm basically taking the continuous elements of any given G set. Um, so by the proposition from earlier, this is a broken deep topos. Uh, in fact, it has some properties. This is getting a bit technical, uh, but it's kind of important for, for where this talk is going. Um, so it's an atomic topos, meaning that it's generated by its objects having no, this highlighting is not great, having no non-trivial sub-objects. So um, specifically, if I take any action of, a, of my group, then I can divide it into orbits and these can't be reduced further into sub-G sets. So that's why they have no non-trivial sub-objects. And so being generated by these is just a statement about being able to decompose any given G set into these ones. Um, it's also two-valued, which means that the terminal object is 
one such atom. So conversely, if I have a topos with these properties and I have a nice point of such a topos, so here this topos has a point, which is to say a uh, geometric morphism from the category of sets, which more precisely is to say uh, <laughs> an adjunction from the category of sets, so where the um, left adjoint is the functor back to the category of sets, which is just a forgetful functor. Um, and given an adjunction with all of those properties, all of the relevant properties, uh, we can recover a topological group presenting this topos. So we have a characterization in terms of these properties and the existence of the point. So um, also we can recover a site. I mentioned that I, we can describe any Grothendieck deep topos using uh, a site. And in this case, the site that we, the, the kind of canonical site um, consists of those atoms that I mentioned. Uh, so the irreducible G sets um, and the atomic topology. So whenever I have a site that produces a topos of this form, then I can look at the atoms of it. Um, and I obviously have a topological, a topological group presenting it. And that gives me an invariant of the site. But if the site is of a certain form, so it's a site which has reasonable properties, which is to say, I can define the atomic topology on it. Then I have a functor from C to my category, um, to, to my category. So this is a stand-in for the continuous actions of my topological group. Uh, and it sends each object to an atom. And so I can identify each object of C with one of these irreducible G sets. And the key, the way this all relates back to Galois theory is that I can index these continuous principal G sets using the open subgroups of G. Um, so in particular, if I'm taking the trivial, if I'm taking the discrete topology on G, then this will be all subgroups of G. And so I have a correspondence between um, the objects of C, uh, sorry, I, I, I have a mapping from the objects of C to the subgroups of G. Uh, which is order reversing. So to recover classical Galois theory, I take C to be the opposite of the category of the intermediate subfields. Uh, that's just a technical condition to make the topology work. <laughs> um, and this has all of the properties that are needed to define the atomic topology and to determine um, a topos of group actions. Um, so the fundamental theorem is actually saying that this is a subcanonical topology and this is exactly a canonical site for this topos. So that's why we get all of the subgroups of our Galois group appearing um, in the correspondence with the subfields of our, uh, in our field extension. Um, and more generally, we can remove the bounding larger field. So for example, I can consider all of the um, algebraic extensions. I can consider the algebraic completion of my field, and rather than getting a discrete group, um, I get a topological group, and everything still works. That's why I had to go <laughs> to the to the effort of introducing topological groups. So I don't know how much time I have left. It's probably negative. Um, so here's the short version. Uh, all of this, all of the topos theory side works for monoids too. Uh, so I can think of a monoid as a one object category. I get pre sheaves. The argument about the continuous actions for a given topology all works. So I get a great and deep topos. What changes is that I have to replace atomic by super compactly generated. Um, but we still have a two valued topos. Um, so if I have a topos with these properties and a point, I can recover a topological monoid. Um, and given a suitable site, I get a mapping from the objects of that site to the principal M sets, which are the super compact objects. Um, and finally, the, these super compact objects are indexed rather than, rather than by submonoids, by right congruences on my monoid. Um, so we build up a nice parallel at the topos theory level, uh, but there are a couple of problems in that 
I don't yet know. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yet known what the right algebraic picture is. Um, so I'm going to stop there since I was a bit late. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.